Good morning, my name is Stephen Capaldo from uh, Echad Unity Ministries in uh, North Providence, Rhode Island. Welcome. It's a Saturday, January 30th, 2016, and it's a nice day here in North Providence. Um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, God's Word, um, God's Word of Absolute Righteousness, and contra contrasting it with you know where we came from, as you know being under the law, and now we're under God's God's Word of Absolute Righteousness, and, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is, and and what it isn't, and uh, we'll do a message like that. So before we begin, uh, thank you, Father, for uh, for this day and the possibility of, uh, of filming and coming forth with a message, and may it be a blessing and an edification to those who will hear it. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Amen. So I'll begin by uh, going to Romans uh, chapter seven, verse seven. I read a few verses there, and then just just get into kind of a discussion of uh, you know what what the, the the law was and how it contrasts with uh, God's word of absolute righteousness. I, I don't want to call it God's law of absolute righteousness because I don't want there to be any confusion with Mosaic law. Mosaic law we're not under, but God's word, yes, we are under God's word. But uh, word and law, you know, it's the same Greek word, logos, you know, so sometimes it causes some confusion. So I just wanted to make that point right at the beginning that there's no there, 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 there's no suggestion that we're under the Mosaic law. No, that's that covenant has been satisfied by the blood of Jesus Christ. But we are under God's word of absolute righteousness. So Romans chapter 7, verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. When the Mosaic law was given, you know, it was uh, it was part of God's perfect plan for man at that time. That's what man was ready for, and that's what man uh, wanted to do. They wanted to follow laws, and they wanted a king. They wanted to be just like everybody else. They didn't want to live in the righteousness of God. They wanted to live in, in the flesh, and that's what God knew, uh, and so that's what God gave them. For I had not known uh, Lust, except the law had said, "Thou shalt not covet." So uh, this is this is it. You know, there were a bunch of uh, rules, and uh, but people acting in the flesh. And what's what's the ultimate result of that? Is that people turn to sin? They turn away from God. If people are not walking in the spirit, if rather they're walking in the flesh, ultimately they're going to walk away from uh, walk away from God, and that's that's really what sin is: it's separation from God. Well, we have some Canada geese going by, maybe I'll hit your ride back to Canada one of these days. But, uh, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence or lust, for without the law sin was dead. So before the, before the Mosaic law was instituted by God, uh, there, there was uh, more of a faith relationship, for example, between Abraham and God. It was this, this, this desire for rules and desire for the law, you know, that, uh, that, that really, uh, got man focused on keeping rules and then uh, that became too much in the flesh without the spirit so then eventually you know Israel turned away from God and went into these prolonged periods of sin so much so that God actually divorced Israel for the, the last 500 years or so before the, the coming of Jesus Christ the first coming uh, you know, there's no record uh, of, of the Old Testament uh, writings for about 500 years. You know, God was silent. God was saying, no, this is not, you know, you have not fulfilled, you know, what I've given you to fulfill. And so, you know, there's going to have to be a continuation of the plan. But there was a period of si silence. And you can contrast that nowadays. I mean, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you sometimes go through periods of silence. You know, where you don't believe that God is speaking to you. Now, maybe it's because of sin, or maybe it's just because God is trying to teach you something and, you know, get you to be more dependent on Him instead of dependent on other, other things or, or humans or whatever, the world system. But certainly, uh, two things about God is that, you know, He doesn't, he's, he's not always talking. There are periods of silence with God, and He doesn't do things until He's ready. And by human reckoning, sometimes it takes God an awful long time to act. But, you know, if God is eternal, he's, you know, he, you know we've got the watches, he's got the time, right? You know, he's, he, he can wait. You know, he doesn't have to uh, act on our timetable. Uh, we want things done quickly. But God proceeds on his own timetable. He's not late. But at time, he's not constricted by time. So when we complain that things are not on time, that God has taken a long time, that really doesn't mean much to God because he's eternal anyway. I mean, what's what's the problem if it's, you know, now or next week or next year or 100 years? You know, for him, that's not a problem. 
For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. I died spiritually. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. The law, the law of righteousness, God's righteousness, which replaced the, the, the Mosaic law. So I'll uh, go now to Colossians, uh, Col uh, Colossians, uh, Colossians. Uh, chapter 2, and I'll, I'll read a few verses there. Um, for I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. So the brethren, this is a call for the unity of the brethren, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, that all believers are united, all are one in Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So the entire truth of the word of God. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. And this is something that we, we have to be very careful of, is the, the enticing words, because we hear a lot of things, especially now, and uh, to have the discernment to know that something is truly of God, and something is truth and not error, and, and, you know, and it's not sin and it's not evil, but it truly is of God, uh, that, the, that the, the, the source is uh, someone who is... Uh, you know, who is, is a believer and, and is uh, and loves good and does good because he loves good. I mean, that's that's a very, uh, you know, that, that takes a lot of discernment because you hear a lot of things that sound very good. And even, you know, Christianity, Christianity, people in Christianity have this ability to cloak themselves with some kind of a aura of respectability or aura of sanctity or aura of holiness. And, 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 and sometimes it isn't that way. I mean, when you really... Uh, uh, if you have insider discernment into the deeper motivations of of uh, things that people say and do, who call themselves Christians, you know sometimes it just doesn't stand up to the test. And it's not a question of being uh, uh, of judging someone for heaven or hell. That's not up, up to us. But we certainly have to be able to have discernment and be able to assess the motivations of other people. That's absolutely absolutely critical. We don't have any word to say about uh, judging people for heaven or hell. That's totally within the purview of God. And you know we try to give the information, uh, you know, what, what to do for eternal life, but really it's between the individual and God, you know, and it's, uh, you know, we, we believe, and you know, in our ministry we believe that uh, it's, it's not believable if you're truly saved, it's not believable that you, you would never bear any fruit, <laughs> or, you know, you, it's, it's not believable. Why would God save you for a life that involved no, no service, no fruits, uh, you know, not, not that would involve you in this in the lifestyle you were involved with before. To us, it's 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 not logical. At the same time, it's not up to us to say that someone is saved or not saved. But uh, if you are truly saved, then you will bear fruit, and you know you'll stumble once in a while. You may stumble for a season, maybe even a long season, but you repent, you know, and you you come back. But it's not the the the, the fruitless life. Um, it's hard to believe that you've renewed the mind and you're transformed if you lead a totally fruitless life. But anyway, that's up to the individual. That's between uh, that's between the individual and God. I think we just have to kind of liberate ourselves of all kind of you know legalistic arguments and semantic games and this type of thing. We just have to focus on uh, the Word of God as much as possible and and tell truth, speak truth as much as possible. And uh, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. This is Paul saying to Col Colossae. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. The, the walking in him, the everyday, the everyday journey of faith, the everyday dedication to the things of God, to the word of God, to applying the word of God, to bearing fruit, uh, really to this whole, to, the, to, to God's absolute righteousness. Because really, Jesus Christ went to the cross to show the absolute righteousness of God in the, in the uh, trial uh, between God and Satan. That's really, he went to the cross to show his absolute righteousness, which then freed uh, the flesh, free, freed our flesh from the need to commit sin, from the need to be separate from God. So this is really 
the, the, the biggest lesson of the cross. And now, once we believed in Jesus Christ, that he's the Son of God, and that he was, uh, you know, he died and was buried and resurrected on the third day, then really we are submitted to his absolute righteousness. And um, this absolute righteousness is uh, something that has characteristics. The absolute righteousness of God, it's, it's, uh, it's an expectation of a certain lifestyle. And... Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to call it laws and rules because then we're going to get into that whole, you know, the tapes are going to start turning and, you know, it's legalism and it's works and it's this and that and we don't want to get into that. But, but certainly God is absolute righteousness. And if he is absolute righteousness, then of his children, he does have expectations. He would expect that if you're born again and saved and you've accepted his absolute righteousness, that you, you, you live a certain way, you think a certain way, the mind is renewed, you're transformed, that, that that's going to happen that if you are truly saved, this will happen. And so some of the characteristics of this absolute righteousness would be uh, love, obviously, and you, you, know, you can read to get some of the specific characteristics of love. You can read 1 Corinthians 13, but it's, uh, lo love is just, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's God's character. It's God's integrity. It's the way God is. He, he loves. Now, sometimes love is, is difficult. It's a difficult thing to, uh, to, to, to bring forth to someone because it's, it seems a little bit harsh to humans. Humans are kind of used to thinking of love as, as uh, uh, is something kind of emotional and uh, even sometimes it can be a little bit syrupy sweet and, and not real. But uh, God's love is both. God's love is both uh, uh, tough and soft. It's, it's tender and merciful and compassionate, but it's also, you know, candid, frank, straightforward, truthful, and, you know, maybe t saying some things that people don't want to hear. And uh, joy, that's part of his righteousness, is that the happiness of God in all circumstances, that um, God says we will have momentary light afflictions, but he does say that uh, that we are to have joy, not a silly smile plastered on our face. That's not joy. Joy is it is simply that the 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 happiness of knowing that Jesus Christ is in is in charge of your life, is that you've you've given your life unto him, you've submitted yourself to his absolute righteousness, and, and you want to reflect his love to a lost and dying world. And, and you, you want to be available to souls, you know, souls uh, for them to accept Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and, and then to help them get started in the life, the, the, the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ, the, the transforming and the renewal of the mind that, that leads to the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, peace, prosperity, uh, mercy. And uh, another uh, thing that's part of the justice of God is... Uh, uh, obviously, grace is part of the justice of uh, is part of the righteousness of God, but uh, justice is also uh, part of the righteousness of God. Is that God does demand uh, justice? He he he. Uh, his will has to be done, and. Uh, there is this decision that you have to make in life that you accept or you don't accept Jesus Christ, um, and sometimes people ask, "Well, what does that have to do with grace?" Well. Uh, you, you, how do you have grace without justice? How do you have justice without grace? I mean, God's, you know, it's true that everything God gives us is by his grace, but uh, if you indulge in sin and evil, uh, you don't receive the unmerited favor, if, uh, the unmerited favor of God for that. You have to, in some way, submit to God's justice. I mean, uh, if you know, if you commit sin or evil, you reap what you sow. So there is a place for justice and for grace, and it's all part of the nature and character of God. And ultimately, it's all part of His absolute righteousness. And a lot of times Christians don't want to hear that because they just want to talk about God's grace, you know, the unmerited favor. And it's always when we get God's favor, it is always unmerited because God is the source of all good things. Uh, but when we indulge in a lifestyle or activities that are contrary to God, we, we can hardly expect that God is going to pour out favor on us for that. No, you, 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 he, his, his justice comes at that, at that point. Uh, we, we reap what we sow. You know, there's that side of it as well. And so absolute righteousness also uh, involves uh, giving and service and um, just being considerate of other people. I mean, that's really the, the, that's really the point, is that when you, uh, when you have lost uh, um, a love of the things of the world and you focus on your love for God and you really love the things of God and you, you, know, you put the things of the world second, 
you know, behind your love for God, your love for God takes precedence, then, then really uh, giving and service, uh, th th this becomes kind of the goal of your life, that you're more considerate of other people and, and you know, you're wondering what you can do to help other people and uh, you don't want to be taken advantage of by other people. You need, you need to weigh that and balance that with discernment, obviously, but really the giving and serving should become the focus of the person who truly has, has uh, um, you know, accepted the righteousness of God and, uh, accepted his love and grace and mercy and you know sometimes we want to accept the good things but or what we think are the good things but the things that are kind of you know obligations or require a bit of an effort you know uh, we, we, we want to look at that as you know not really being of uh, being uh, under God's grace but everything we get from God is from his grace even if you get discipline or punishment or justice for something it's because God, God is gracious God is showing grace maybe to the victims of the people that you've used and abused God is showing grace to you to let you know that uh, you know, he he has to do certain things to discipline you. He disciplines his own children. We know that from the scripture, uh, because you know he has a standard. He has a, he has a standard. He has a standard of righteousness. And if you fall short of that standard of righteousness, then as a child of God, as a born again believer, you can expect uh, some kind of discipline. And if it just goes on and on and on, you might even get a trip home early. You know, he may take you home early. I mean, that's a possibility too for a believer. If, if uh, you know, in order to protect that believer from the, the, the ravages of, of living without God, you know, even though the person has been saved. So, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And this is really the foundation, I would say, of our prayer life. God knows what we need before we pray it. So the point is not that we're telling things to God that he doesn't already know. He knows what we need before we say what we need. But he wants us to communicate with him. That's part of the communication, back and forth. And the, the big thing uh, in, in prayer is to show thanksgiving and, and to intercede for others. Of course, we can petition for ourselves, but it's a question of priorities. If you're really submitted to the righteousness of God and to the principles of his character and integrity, then when you pray... Your prayers are really not about whether you're sitting, standing, kneeling, lying down. Not about whether your eyes are open or closed. Uh, you know, this is not about stuff like that. It, it's it's about uh, genuine thanksgiving, giving a thanks to God, and uh, and interceding for others. You know, praying for others. You, you know, you you. you you ask for things for other people. You you know God's not going to violate their free will. We know that. But uh, <clears throat> if if a person somehow senses that other people are praying, then perhaps there will be some kind of impact, some kind of change, some kind of decision that's made. You know to turn towards the, the Lord. And, and you can ask. You can petition. Um, you know, I mean, I think God is not so impressed if you petition for, you know, trivial materialistic things. But, but if, there, if, if there's a need, especially for the ministry that he's given you and the, you know, the life that he's given you uh, of walking in the spirit, if there's some kind of need there, I mean, God knows it. And if it's uh, the right thing at the right time, God will supply it. He gives us what we need. Uh, to do what he has for us to do. So that's the thing. We have to be in God's will and be aligned with what he wants for our lives. And then he, it's, then it's, his, it's, it's his obligation to supply the provision, to give the, the support uh, of what's needed to fulfill the ministry, fulfill the will uh, and the calling that God has upon our lives. You know, and, and uh, you know, he gives you certain anointings and talents and whatever, and, and so certain abilities and you know, certain things to do with those abilities. It's up to him to fund that, to support that, to make sure that that, that can be carried out on, uh, on planet Earth. And so I'll go to one final passage, uh, Hebrews 8, verse 7. Um, and this is, again, comparing the new covenant, the, the, the absolute righteousness of God, um, saying that the new covenant is is better than the old. The old was fine for its time, but it has been fulfilled, and now we have the new covenant. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So that's that's kind of a kind of an obvious thing. We don't think about that very often, is that well, you know, if the old were perfect, if the old covenant were perfect, why would we have needed a new covenant? I mean, there'd be, no, there'd be no point to it. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, with believing. 
uh, people, not, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, the all, all believers, after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. So, so instead of the, the laws being on tablets of stone, the laws... Uh, the, 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 love, the love commandments, the you know what God wants you to do, the principles of his absolute righteousness, are on the inside of you. Because when you believe in Jesus Christ, the Spirit does what? The Spirit comes within. So you've got the power of God inside of you now. And you begin to speak truth, right? And that's, that, that's, that, that, that's kind of a new language, even if it's in your language. That's kind of a new language. All of a sudden, you're speaking truth. You weren't speaking truth before because you didn't have the power of God inside of you. Now you have it inside of you. So you're speaking whatever language it is that you speak, but now you're using that language to speak truth. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that, he said, a new covenant, he made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So that's what happened with the Mosaic Law, the Old Covenant, and God replaced it with the, the New Covenant. And here he's writing in Hebrews, as you know, he's writing it. We, we don't know the, the author of it. Uh, it may be Paul, it may be someone else, but it's, it's especially to Jewish believers, this, uh, this particular. But really, the, 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 the House of Israel, uh, broadly speaking, can refer to the entire body of believers, all, all believers, or, or it, it can refer uh, you know, to Jewish believers. So that's a little bit of, um, you know, what God had for us in the old and what he has for us in the new, which is walking with the Spirit. Now the Spirit is within us, and we're to walk in the absolute righteousness of God. Love, joy, peace, grace, mercy, justice, giving, service, all of the characteristics of God, whatever they are, you can add more to them. But all of these traits are part of the absolute righteousness of God, and that's really what Jesus Christ was expressing on the cross, was God's absolute righteousness in the trial between God and Satan. And this righteousness liberated the flesh from the need to sin, so we don't need to sin anymore. Even though we still walk in the flesh, but while we are still in the flesh, we are to walk by the Spirit. So that's really the idea. Not that we don't sin. We still we're, we're, we walk in the Spirit. We live in the Spirit, but we are still in the flesh. So we do. We still sin. The point is not to, as, as I have said before, the point is not to be sinless. The point is now we can sin less. We are capable of sinning less because we have a new nature. The mind is being renewed. Uh, we're being transformed. So the, the old nature is being crowded out. So there should you should see that in your life. You start to love the things of God, and you, you, uh, you sin less. But it is, you know, God did say, you know, in Christ, uh, one of the results of Christ's righteousness is that, uh, you know, he's saying you really don't need to sin. Now, obviously, he knows we will sin, but you don't need to sin, you know. I've taken away the flesh's need to sin, sin by my righteousness and by my death on the cross, by shedding my blood. You don't have to do that. But he knows we will occasionally do that, and so we can repent of that, and that's, that's fine. But, but, but if you really grow, and the mind is renewed and transformed, and you, know, you start bearing fruit, then that old nature is crowded out. Right? The new nature dominates, the new nature takes over. That's the best we can do. I mean, Jesus Christ was able to live the sinless life because uh, of you know how, how he was born and uh, the total unity that he enjoyed with his Father through eternity. So he he you know he was able to do his job of being sinless, uh, so being sinless. Us, it's sinning less is really what we're trying to get to. But uh, but but you know, in in principle, the, the message of the cross is that uh, we sh we should be separated from sin. We don't have to live in sin. You know, we're freed from sin, so if we choose to go back to it, that's our choice. And we do it once in a while, everybody stumbles once in a while, so we repent. You might even stumble for quite a while, but you can repent if you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. So I'll let it go there, and uh, thank you, Father, for this time together and this chance to uh, come forward with a message, and may it be a blessing and an edification to those who will hear it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Betsy.